Good morning, church. Thanks so much for joining us online this morning. Obviously, this isn't our preferred way to gather, but it's important for right now. And so here we are. And just a quick note, if you lose us, if the live stream drops, uh, we are doing a backup recording. So check back later today and we'll have that posted. Hopefully we can just um, keep going and the live stream will hold strong. But if not, we will have the sermon posted later today. Uh, Just a couple of announcements uh, before we jump in this morning. First of all, um, online will be the plan for this week and next week at least. So next Sunday, you'll find us in the find us in the exact same space um, here on YouTube. And then after that, we'll just see what um, is happening in our community and we'll make decisions going forward um, once we get there. Um, this morning was supposed to be a celebration for Pastor Zach to mark his five years here with the Elnick Church of Christ. I announced six weeks ago this morning that um, that actual Sunday in August was the five-year mark, but both his family and my family were in isolation due to travel, so we couldn't properly celebrate. Um, And then this today, we are now uh, in this format. So we've decided once again to postpone the celebration, uh, which is not a reflection of our desire to celebrate him, but only uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. So we will move forward with that once we are able to. Um, In the meantime, you know, just feel free to send encouragement and appreciation his way in whatever way you would like to do so um, and let him know that you're glad that he's here. Um, Next, prayer and fasting. Uh, This is happening Wednesday nights at 730 at the church. Um, Moving forward, we're going to have to limit that to 10 people um, to be in line with the COVID measures that are in place. And so we're allowed to have 10 people in this building. So we are going to do that. We've opened a sign up on the website. So you can head to ykcofc.ca and sign up to join us for prayer in person here. Uh, We have tons of space to safely distance 10 people in here. So um, come if you're able and just sign up on the website uh, in order to do that. Um, If you are If you would rather participate at home, we will send the Zoom link out on Wednesday. So just check your emails. Join us um, online if you would prefer to participate that way. Um, And then last but not least, offering the best way to give right now is through e-transfer to office at ykcofc.ca. And as we've said so many times during this pandemic, um, just because we aren't able to all be together as we once were, the need to give has not decreased at all. And so we just encourage you to consider um, giving um, of money as a way to participate in your worship. And so if you are able and willing to do that this morning, again, just e-transfer to office at ykcofc.ca. I think that's all I have for this morning. So I'll pass it over to Pastor Zach. Well, good morning, church. It is uh, good to be with you, albeit in a uh, somewhat frustrating format, but good to be able to gather. We're thankful for technology on days like today. Uh, Before I I get started, I think we should just uh, open in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for today. I thank you for your promises to us all throughout Scripture. I thank you that one of them is that your spirit is with us, that it indwells us. And I thank you that even though we're separated today, we're so many of us not in the same place, that when we gather like this in your name, that your spirit ministers to us, it draws us together and it draws us into your truth. And I pray that that would happen right across all the lines of technology this morning. People would be drawn into your truth. I commit now the meditation of my heart and essentially the offering of my lips here to you. I ask that you use them for your purposes in everyone who takes part of this message in their lives, but also in the sake of this church, even as we're separated today. Amen. All right, church. Well, here we are again, uh, right in the middle of a sermon series on this grievous moment. (laughs) I find myself again, preaching to a camera and You are at home watching me on a screen. I suspect today there exists in each of you no shortage of feelings and opinions and convictions about the current COVID measures and the cause behind them. 
Uh, of course, the most current grief we might say uh, in this uh, issue of COVID measures is uh, the strain that our hospitals are experiencing. And of course, our hospital here in Yellowknife, uh, there's an ICU bed shortage uh, that we're facing. And so we've moved into this uh, moment of pause and circuit breaking to try to make sure that our hospital can handle everything that it needs to do. And of course, this is sad. Uh, of course, this is scary. But it's perhaps not entirely surprising that the hospital struggle would cause us then to have measures and actions that we need to participate in. Uh, I think that right through this pandemic, from basically day one until now, uh, the ebbs and flows of government measures have largely been connected to healthcare system and making sure that our healthcare systems can handle that. And that's understandable, uh, especially now as we see what's happening in Alberta, my home province, and many of the other provinces down south, and the incredible strain, uh, to say the least, that their hospitals are under. And so, of course, the actions taken to protect healthcare systems um, are, are not all in this moment that would cause us grief. There, because of these measures, are other causes of grief. The ongoing disruption uh, to the education of our children and the demands that this puts on parents to be homeschoolers and teachers uh, and still trying to do their jobs and everything else that their lives require. The economic impacts on businesses and the practical day-to-day -day operations of businesses and, and the staff shortages due to homeschooling and COVID measures and isolations and everything in between. And I suspect as I'm saying all of this, you're thinking to yourself, we all right, Rian? Okay, but we're on here. Okay, I'll try to just, you, you can do it. Sorry for the interruption. We're just trying to make sure we, we're covered in case I get disconnected here. But I suspect as I'm talking about all of these uh, frustrations and challenges in this COVID era, era, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, we know, Zach, we are living them too. We've heard you talk about them. We've read them in every news headline this week. Uh, we know exactly what they are. And so today I want to talk then about a cause for grief that is perhaps less on our minds, maybe less in our hearts, maybe even less on our lips in conversation and the way we're expressing our frustrations or grieves, grievous moments um, in these days. And basically that cause of grief is this, what God has lost during this pandemic. You see, as Christians, what God loses should ultimately be our greatest cause of grief. So in the book of 1 Peter, the apostle describes Christians like this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Now you'll notice that nowhere in here does Peter describe Christians as evangelicals or mainliners, as Republicans or Democrats, as conservatives or liberals. As Christians, rather, we are defined by the fact that we minister to the true God and that we are God's special possession that we might declare his praises. You see then amongst all the things that we have made staples of Christianity, at the core, we are a new nation, a holy nation. We are God's possession, and we are ministers whose function is to declare his praises. This is how we are defined. This is what we should be doing. This is what God requires. And so in our nation, well, so much requires our sacrifice right now and is a cause for grief, we should be considering what we, as the royal priesthood, are grieved about what causes our grief and our deepest grief should be different from our government's grief to be honest and even the grief of our neighbors to be honest and even the grief of our friends and even the grief of our family because we should be first and foremost grieved about what God has lost because we are a holy nation we are not just Canadians or just Americans or just British or just whatever country we may hail from, but we are God's nation. We are his possession. 
And so we're defined then by what matters to that nation. And what matters to that nation is first and foremost, what is God grieved about? So to explore this idea of God's grief and then for how we are grieved because of that, we're going to turn to a book that you're likely not expecting we turn to today. We're going to turn to the book of Joel. Now, let me say this. I was not prepared to preach on Joel this week. I actually had a different message basically finalized. And then when these new measures came in, I felt like that message wasn't the best message for today. And so I switched gears and I went into a book that I've been uh, prayerfully in and meditating on for the last couple of weeks. And so here we are in the book of Joel. So if you don't know where the book of Joel is, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, if you can find Psalms, which is approximately in the middle of your Bible, maybe a little bit uh, towards the front, but approximately in the middle. It's uh, 10 books. Joel's 10 books to the right of Psalms. And it's about 11 books, I believe, back from Matthew. And so if you do that, you should find this little book of Joel, just a three chapter book in the minor prophets section of the Old Testament. Book of Joel. Now, I'm going to be covering a lot of text today. Uh, and because there's so much text, I will only have some of the text on these slides. So I really encourage you to use your Bible. So if you've got the hard copy, that's the best copy still in my opinion. But if you want to use a digital format on your phone or a tablet, go ahead, find that. Find the book of Joel. It's probably easier to find that way. And uh, we're going to get going. So beginning in chapter one of the book of Joel, we'll start with this statement. That we should be grieved that God has lost worship. Let's read the first Let's go ahead and read the first about 14 verses of this chapter together. So it says this. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of our, your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. And here's the problem. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. In other words, there's a serious locust plague going on in Judah. And so Joel goes on, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land. This is still talking in the context of the locusts. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up. The fig tree is withered. And the pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy has withered away. So here's the response. Verse 13. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. If you carry on, and we're going to stop there because we do have so much text, but if you carry on, what you'll see is the next description is actually the animals. They'll talk about horses and camels not having enough to eat, and they're groaning, they're mourning. So what you see then is the whole land, the people who inhabit it, the, the crops, the trees, and even the animals. Everyone is grieved over what's taking place. The cause of this, of course, is a locust plague. And what's interesting is that though the cause of their mourning is that these locusts have plundered everything in the trees and the fields, the greatest grief that we actually find in Joel chapter 1 is over the breakdown of the worship system. You see, with no grain offering, with no drink offering, the proper offerings can't be given 
to God. And so if you look in your Bibles at verses 9 and verses 13 of Joel chapter 1, what does it say? Verse 9 says, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. In verse 13, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For here it is again, the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. So, of course, the destruction affects the farmers, and we see them wail in verse 11. They're grieved. But you see that they are grieved most deeply in this chapter over the breakdown of the worship. They can't worship if they don't have the offerings. If they can't come to the temple, to the house of the Lord, and make their offerings, then they actually, you see, aren't what they are supposed to be, which is God's people who obey and worship him. This is who they are. If they can't do that, then they can't even be who they're created to be. God loses his worship and the people lose their identity. You see, for them, losing worship wasn't just about losing that activity that they enjoyed doing once a week where they saw their friends. The loss of worship was what was completely central to their whole society, to their day-to-day lives. This wasn't just about a, a moment. It was everything was touched by this. And that's why I so appreciate the language of verse 9. In verse 13, because there is no longer any offerings, the priests mourn. Those who minister before the Lord mourn. The destroyed crops, it affects the priests. And I obviously relate to this. But it affects them in two ways. You see, they're not able to lead the people in proper worship. I've been feeling like this for 18 months. But also, the priests are going to go hungry. As the priests in this day eat from the offering that is brought to the temple. So the, the priests are actually fed from the grain and from the wine. So if there's no grain offerings and no wine offerings, the priests actually starve. And then look at verses 14 and 15 of this, which we didn't read together, but or maybe we did 14, but also include 15. So declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. So now it's not just the priests who are struggling. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. So the whole community, it's not just destruction that the priests are going to feel. It's not just starvation of the priests. It's not even just the grief of the priests over the loss of worship. It's everybody. It's the whole community. Call the elders. Call everyone. Summon them. And let's fast and let's mourn and let's pray because this destruction is going to, we're all going to feel it. It's coming on all of us. So do you see then that there's no division here between life and worship? If the people can't live, the people can't worship. And if the people can't worship, it means that they're not living as they should be physically. They're lacking something. Life and worship are not disconnected from one another. And so I hope you see that in all of this, that really what they are most grieved over is what God is losing. Offerings are are, are God's. They are are the nation uh, living as his possession, living in his delights, best gifts to him. And when that ceases, the one who is most deeply grieved is God. Yes, the people, but it is ultimately God who loses first. And so I wonder today if we grieve the loss of worship as something that God has lost. Might we grieve for the sake of God's heart, for what God delights in? You know, I know at times we have grieved the loss of worship as a loss of our rights or as a loss of of what we receive when we worship God, you know, that we're edified and we're built up. And that's scriptural and that's important. But do we grieve what God has lost in all of this? Do we grieve that God has lost the worship offerings that he so rightly deserves? And furthermore, I wonder if we grieve the loss of God's worship as the loss of our identity. As these people were afraid was taking place. That we've actually lost in some ways had had our identity as the royal priesthood. The special possession who first and foremost declare the praises of God. If that's removed, then really who are we and what, what do we do? 
Do we grieve that if we don't worship God properly, that in fact our function as his holy nation is somehow less than it was? Or perhaps we aren't that grieved about any of this. And we're mostly okay to just let worship go for now because it was never really one of our highest priorities anyways. God losing his worship is just one of many things that we might feel frustrated about. But it's not quite as high as our frustrations over the loss of easy travel or being forced to wear a mask or homeschooling our kids. And the list of frustration for each of us only go from there. Or perhaps we're willing to let God's worship go without much grief because it was never really about God for us, but more about us and what we get from God's worship. And I know that these are hard questions. I'm aware that they're hard questions. Joel, in a way, is a hard book. But I do understand the prophetic challenge of Joel chapter 1 and the desire to also be pastoral with the hope and the desire to remind you that God has lost in all of this too. And as his holy nation, maybe that's something that should grieve our hearts. And what God has lost affects the rest of our lives far more than perhaps we have been aware of, perhaps more than we're thinking about. Therefore, I'm suggesting that might we add to our grief that this church in Yellowknife has not sang an offering to God in 18 months. That's just one example of our worship offerings being devoured by this locust plague that we're all under at this moment. This COVID pandemic, like the locust plague of Joel, has for now stolen what we offer to God and how we do that. And so we have lost something, yes, but who has ultimately lost? God. Because God is the one who's ultimately the one deserving of this. Our job is to praise him, to offer praises to him, and we're not doing that. Now, let me be really clear here. I'm not suggesting that because that's the case and because for 18 months we haven't sang in church that we should become like Robespierre and storm the Bastille and revolt. I'm not suggesting that for one second. The prescription that we find in Joel for the grief is fasting and mourning in prayer. (laughs) That's our revolution. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That's our revolution. To come before the Lord as a community and say, God, we are so sad about this. We're so sad about what we've lost, but we're even more sad about what you've lost and and seemingly what you're losing. And so we're grieved about it. We mourn together. We pray together. We fast together. We do it as a community. We do it with elders and we do it with children and we do it with the ministers. And we come together. This is what we do about it. This is how Christians can protest this moment. Now, I think we can find a lot of connections between this crisis and our own in just that first chapter. But amazingly, the connections go on. And I think you'll relate to this. You'll understand this connection fairly quickly. You see, while Judah was grieving, and that's where we're left. They're grieving. They've called this sacred assembly. They're mourning and fasting and praying. And while they are already in crisis and already managing this locust plague, it gets worse before it gets better. It does get better. And we're going to talk about that. But it actually gets worse. The crisis worsens, and the mourning turns to repentance. And so we learn in chapter 2 this, that we should be grieved that God loses our obedience, that God has at times lost our obedience. So we're going to jump into Joel 2 in just a second. Let me say this. While the people are mourning over the breakdown of the worship system and the practical problems of drought, this new threat appears. It's quite similar to the first. It's a bigger army of locusts. And it's now approaching. And they've got to sound the alarm. And they've got to get ready. And it's going to bring fire and drought and destruction. Somewhat not unlike the fourth wave of COVID. After three waves before. Now this new wave of locusts comes. And it's a little bit worse. So let's read the first 11 verses of chapter 2. To get the, the, the flavor of what's taking place here. So again, they're dealing with the locust plague. Praying, mourning, fasting. And then we read, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. 
like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them, fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them, it's a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry with a noise like that of chariots, and they leap over the mountaintops like a crackling fire, consuming stubble like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They cha charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run all along the wall. They climb into houses like thieves. They enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army and his forces are beyond number. And mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? So that's a lot of trouble, <laughs> to say the least. It's a lot of destruction. It's carnage. It's grief. It's fire. It's fear. And amongst it all, did you notice who's leading the army of locusts? In verse 11, we read that the head of the army is God himself. In verse 11 and 12, we actually read, and we haven't got to 12 yet, so you'll have to trust me. But in verse 11 and 12, we read that God is both the head of his invading force, but he's also the one in which the people must turn to for deliverance. Now that may challenge some of your thinking in regard to God being one who disciplines his people or acts in just holiness. But it's there. We can't get away from it. So we ask then, what is the cause of God leading an army of locusts on his people like this? Why would God do this? Or a better question to ask is, what did the people do to grieve God in such a way that he would do this? That he would act like this? You see, the cause of God leading a locust army is the disobedience of the people. And stick with me here because I'm going to give you a little Old Testament history. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God gives some instructions to the nation about living in the promised land. More specifically, he gives them promises for obedience, and then he promises curses for disobedience. And one of those curses is locust plagues. Should they obey, a locust plague is the result. So look at Deuteronomy 28 verses 38 to 42. It says, you will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil because the olives will drop off. You will have sons and daughters, but you will not keep them because they will go into captivity. And then verse 42, again, swarms of locusts will take over all of your trees and the crops of your land. It's exactly what you read taking place in Joel 1 talks about the bark on the trees and it talks about the fields. So the reason that God is leading an army of locusts that devours trees and destroys crops is because his holiness is grieved by the sinful disobedience of the people. And if you've walked as a Christian for any amount of time, you know that the nation, God's people, often struggled with disobedience and things like this would happen. And God would have to correct them. And so... Though this isn't super specific on what their disobedience was, we know that there's some act of disobedience that has now brought this result for disobedience upon them. They failed to live in the land as they should and worship God exclusively, and so this is the result. And that's heavy, and I know that's heavy. But there is good news. The good news for God's people is though disobedience brings judgment from God, repentance may bring help. From that very same God. And so in verse 12, we read that Joel, speaking on behalf of the, of the Lord, calls the people to repentance. And so look at verse 12. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Let's stop there. Now, the language is worth noting here. God says, rend your hearts, not your garments. 
No, this is the only place where an Old Testament prophet calls the nation to tear their hearts. You can find instruction where uh, they are invited, challenged, exhorted to circumcise their hearts, but not tear it. Only Joel says, tear your hearts. And what God's saying through the prophet is that the people's repentance must be absolutely genuine. It must involve those usual formal actions of repentance, like fasting and sorrow and prayer, but it must go beyond the external actions And it must include a genuine change of the heart, a ripping of the heart. And so in all of this, God's grief over disobedience, that this should trouble us. Here's my question for us in this grievous moment we stand in. This moment in which disobedience towards God is often justified and excused and thought very little of. Here's my question. Do you think the church, both in our own city, both in this building, and both the global church we are a part of, has any need for repentance? And I'm not asking you to consider the times in church in which people were unkind to you, or the times where the church went in a direction that you didn't agree with, or any of those other kind of church family dynamics. I'm talking about repenting from some of the bigger, yet maybe less noticeable, and therefore sometimes more justifiable acts of disobedience, like indifference to God and the things of God, like indifference to the gathering for worship, like indifference to serving other people sacrificially, like indifference to taking care of the least of these, which, by the way, specifically is talking about persecuted Christians, or promoting or excusing the individual and our preferences and our schedules instead of God's or God's peoples who may need them. Or perhaps we should find ourselves repenting because we didn't even think that we needed to repent at all. Maybe that's a reason for repentance. I heard it said recently, and I like this. This is sort of my paraphrase of it, but that the person who doesn't think that they have any, the person who believes they have no reason to repent thinks that they know it all. And the person who is quick to repent is the person that knows that they don't, that knows they don't know it all. Church, I suspect that we have reasons to repent. Yes, individually, but even together. Across generations, across years of church life in North America. I suspect that we have grieved God's heart with disobedience, disobedience to indifference, more than we even realize. Specifically, I know that if you read about the seven churches in the book of Revelation, Jesus has criticisms for five of the seven. Five of the seven need course corrections. And I wonder if in this time in which we are so grieved personally, we might consider how our insistence on worshiping false gods and so often placing ourselves first has grieved God's heart. And I'm certain that amongst all the crises that our world is experiencing because of this pandemic, and they are many, and they are significant, and they are serious, there's been tremendous loss. And even amongst that, because we are a holy nation, the royal priesthood, God's special possession called to declare his praises, that no loss will actually be greater than the people of God who do not grow closer to God, or worse, fall away from him because they thought they had it all figured out. I think like the people facing this locust army, in this time of chaos, the very best thing we can do as the people of God, the very best practice, the very most important measure to follow, the the best mandate to march in will be to insist that we keep walking closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to God in such a way that we begin to turn from our old ways and maybe even towards repentance. Repentance is a change. It is a turning. Maybe there are things we have done as a church in North America that we need to walk away from. And if we will commit to at least exploring this, doing this, trying this, I think that we can in faith believe that God may move in powerful ways amongst us. You see, repentance 
places us in a space of God possibility. Back to verse 13 and 14. I love this section of this book. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. And notice what he might just leave behind. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. God's blessing is that they can worship properly. Of all the solutions that they would worship properly. Now, I don't want to get too carried away here, but Joel builds on this call to repent and return to God by describing God. And he describes God by using God's own self-description as he gave to Moses in Exodus 34, uh, when God gave the second copy of the Ten Commandments to him. And it's amazing that God, in almost the same breath as he is described as the head of the army of locusts, he's then described as gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in love, and one who relents from sending calamity. That's tension. (laughs) But this is our God. He is perfectly just and holy, but he is also perfectly gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. And he's not one or the other, and he doesn't become one one day and the other the other day. He does perfectly both, all in his character, all the time. And because God is both, and because God is God, and he's not like us, Joel asks the incredible question of verse 14. Joel says, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. This question, who knows, reminds us that God is sovereign and he's free to do as he wills. The nation at this moment, remember, is standing in judgment and there is no guarantee that God will relent. They may just experience the consequence of their disobedience. But because God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and that he relents from sending calamity, Joel says, who knows? If we return, if we return to him, if we tear our hearts, he may relent. And instead of calamity, he may bless. You see, repentance then is not a formula in in which the one standing in judgment says a prayer and rips a heart and then judgment is lifted. Now, I want to be really careful here. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about how we're justified. Okay? I'm talking about the consequences, the repercussions for our disobedience and our sin. Sometimes when we make terrible decisions, even though we're forgiven, there's still consequence, right? And so that's more what I'm talking about here as we move through this. We can't just say, because I repented, then there's no consequence. You notice Joel doesn't say, God will do this if we repent. He says, who knows? He may. And we affirm then, and I actually think we should celebrate that God is such a personal God that repentance puts us in a space of God possibility, not necessarily God guarantee. We don't know what he'll do. (laughs) We can't demand it or mandate it. God is just God, but he's also personal with personality. But Joel says he may. And based on his character, we ask that incredible question, who knows? He might leave behind a blessing. He may. And in some sense, repentance then is this remarkable act of hope. It's the act that says, if I tear my heart and I posture myself like this, God may. I don't know, but he may. It's an act that places us in a space in which we can say, because of God, there's possibility. Now, before we move out of this point and into our conclusion, I want to point out one last detail. Notice in verse 14, the blessing that Joel hopes for, and I touched on this. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Of all the things that Joel could have said when they're, when they're, relent, uh, when they're tearing their hearts and repenting, of all the things he could have said, God might do this for us. Look at what he says. He says, God may 
Give us blessings of grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Joel doesn't call for repentance so that they can get back to their old life and make money again and live worry-free. The result Joel seeks is worship of God. Grain and drink for the Lord your God that we'd give it back to you. That you would relent and you would turn and you would leave a blessing. And the thing that you bless us with, we give back and we put it back on you. That you would empower us to worship you in a fresh way, in a new way, in a in the right way again. The reason that Joel prays this and he and he trusts this and he hopes for this is that when the Lord is worshipped, the people are blessed. How amazing to see an awareness that worshiping God properly is the greatest blessing. And everything else flows off of that. Might we say the same in our day? Might we say, oh God, as we seek to return and come close to you with everything we have. Not pieces of us, not just the leftovers, not the parts um, that our work didn't take or our children don't need. But all of our lives, not the leftovers, all of our lives, God, might we desire to return in such a way that worship of you is not something that we get through so we can get on with the rest of our day. It's not something we do on Easter morning so we can get on with the rest of our Easter family fun. It's not the thing that we do on Christmas Eve so we can get on with all the things that we have planned. Might we, with our whole lives, not our leftovers, begin to come close to God again? Might we begin to hunger and thirst and pray like this in such a way that we say with hope, God might, if we will. And I want to live in a place in which I am hopefully saying of God, who knows? He just might leave a blessing that draws me closer to him and that it touches all of my life from that place. God, might you help us to return to you. This is the cry of the church. This is the cry of the holy nation, the special possession, the people of God. This is what our heart should be longing for, that we come closer and closer and closer to you. Now, as we wrap up, let me leave you with this reminder on that point. God did relent. And he actually undid all the damage. Grain and wine flowed again. It's an amazing verse in there where it says, and I will return all the years that the locusts stole. That's amazing. And as if that wasn't good enough, God goes on. And he promises to pour out his spirit on all people. Look at Joel 2, 28 and 29. And afterward, after all of what I've done for you, after all that I've returned, after restoring the worship, then on top of all that, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Who wants that for their children right now? Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, this isn't just for the elite. This isn't just for the priests. This isn't just for the special people called for special missions of God. It's not just for Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Jeremiah and Isaiah. It is for all people, men and women, even the simple servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. What a promise on top of everything else. And this promise was literally church. Like you need to understand that when God says this, what he is promising is he's promising a direct experience of God. An infilling that would empower all people. And this is the critical part to love God with their whole heart. Those torn hearts would be empowered in such a way that they could love God with all of it. All of it. Something that had always been a struggle. And church, here's the incredible thing. This promise that was given to these people was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. And it was given to men and women and old and young, free and slaves, to priests and parishioners, to princes and paupers, to the rich and the poor. It was poured out on all flesh. And this is the day that we are living in. This is the day. And for Joel's generation, it's just a promise. For this generation, this is our reality. Will we walk in it, though? Will we walk in the promise of experiencing God and loving him with our whole hearts as enabled, as empowered, as made possible by the gift of his very presence in us? You see, church, this pandemic has caused us to worship a lot of things. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but... I'm telling you, we have worshipped fear. 
We have worshiped politics. We have worshiped the individual, the celebration of rights. We have worshiped the body and health. And we have even worshiped health systems. Though those are important things, because God is not often in this list, this should grieve us. And not because, again, those things don't have significant places in our society. But because more and more and more it seems that the absence of God's worship in many lives and homes, even of people who profess to be part of that holy nation, and the disobedience and disobedient indifference to him and his ways are barely on our list of concerns. And that which God is most deeply grieved over, we seem to think isn't that big a deal. God will be okay. And he will be. But I don't think that was ever the point. So might our grievous moment then be first and foremost colored, first and foremost, first and foremost, foundationally colored by our grief over what God has lost. And who knows? to use Joel's words. If enough of us begin to tear our hearts and return to a biblical version of committed following of Jesus Christ, God may relent and he may just leave a blessing. And boy, does our world need that. So as we come to the communion table, if you want to talk about God relenting and leave a bless, leaving a blessing, you've got to look no further than the cross in Jesus Christ. This is the ultimate action of God's relenting, turning, and leaving a blessing. His son shed blood, given for us, humiliated, torn for us, that we would be able to return to God with our whole hearts and eventually even be vessels in which God would live in us because we are so covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he took bread, broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take this in remembrance of the God who relented and left a blessing. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you take this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take it in remembrance of Jesus together. Let's pray. God, in this moment we stand in of grief, this moment of frustration, this moment of uncertainty, I'm thankful that I have you to think about. I'm thankful that we have a vision that is better than this moment. And God, I pray that as we talk about some hard themes today, some things that have grieved you, that our reminder is that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness of God, perfectly demonstrated in Jesus, that draws us back to you. God, we are not condemned. We don't stand today feeling less and less of ourselves. But we do feel convicted that there's always more to go. Perhaps we have made the main thing not the main thing, and things that should have never been the main thing the main thing. So I pray for every life, every ear, every mind that's heard this today, in all their context, in all their own wrestlings, and everything they're facing, and their, their direct involvement in this pandemic to maybe back you know, um, door involvement. Um, God, would you be with all of them and meet them where they are, empower them to love you and come closer to you. And believe in the God in which we can say, who knows, he may just leave a blessing. But also, God, by your spirit, empower us to love you with our whole hearts today, I pray. I commit these words to you. Use them for your purpose, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, I don't have a benediction because I forgot to select one.
I could flip open my Bible and try to pretend and fumble through it and find one, but let's not do that. We'll just go in the classic, go in peace. And I really mean that. Go in peace as you go into this week. Go in in peace, but also pursuit of Jesus and everything that he has for you. God bless you, church. Thanks for being with us today. See you again soon.